different way of receiving the lyrics of the song when you have the visual and the sign language and I appreciate uh, you sharing that tonight, Sister Angie. And also just what you said beforehand too was 
uh, resonating in my heart and goes along with the thought I want to share tonight. This, this last week I preached revival at McFerrin, and as I was preaching and going through different things, there was something I, I mentioned in the message that um, has just kind of stuck with me since then, and I just felt like I needed to explore it some more. And it's the concept of, of revelation and worship. So um, I apologize a little bit, not very much, a little bit to, the, to those who came out and heard uh, the message on Tuesday, because there's going to be a little bit of repeat, but I'm not really going to apologize because um, truth is truth. But um, I want to take our text from a very familiar passage in John's Gospel, John chapter 4, verse 24. And this passage says that God is a spirit. This is Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And what I want us to think about tonight is what it, what it means to worship Him in truth. What does it mean to worship the Lord in truth? We, we emphasize sometimes the worshiping in spirit, and that's an important thing. And both of these are just as important as the other, right? Right? Um, and, and I believe worshiping in spirit means that it has to be real. It has to be sincere and from the heart. But something being sincere is not enough. It must be in spirit and it must be in truth. And I want us to think about just the, the mechanics of worship for a moment. Think about what worship is. And what, the way I want to convey this, the, the structure I, I've as I've been trying to pull this together, I want to share some vignettes with you. Some of the vignettes are like little stories, little situations that we're going to look at, um, little pictures in Scripture, and kind of think about some things that are said and done, and try to connect some concepts, and then we'll come in at the end with some takeaways from this message and how it should impact what we do here at Huntington Missionary Baptist Church every time we get together to worship, every time we come together in service. And so the first one I want us to look at tonight is to go to Mount Sinai together. So let's go to Mount Sinai, and I want to just read a few verses in each of these vignettes here. The situation is Moses up on top of Mount Sinai, and he's there the second time because the first time he was there and got the law and came down, they had the golden calf, and so they already blew it. So he goes up there a second time, to recommit the people of Israel to the covenant that they said they were going to have with God. And while he's up there that second time, Moses is begging God to still go with them. Because God uh, was saying, I'll send an angel, I'll send a messenger. And Moses says, look, if you, Lord, are not going to go with us, don't send us. We need you. And the Lord finally relents, and there in Exodus 33, Moses makes that profound request of the Lord. He says, show me your glory. Show me your glory, Lord. And what's so profound about that is because often when we think about that, we think about Moses having an experience. He wants to see a thing, right? Um, and we read about the Lord taking Moses up to the cleft of the rock and saying, I'll put my hand over you and I'm going to pass by you and I will remove my hand and, and share my glory with you, some degree of my glory. And, and so we think about this, and I remember at least as a kid, I'd always think about Moses seeing some large, shiny person walking by. I guess that's what I had in my head, head as a kid. I don't know what you think about when you've thought about this, what this must have been like. But that kind of flies, that, that kind of thought process flies in the face of everything the Lord had just said in the Ten Commandments. Don't make any graven image like me. There's nothing like me. You, you can't carve something, draw a picture, construct anything that is like me. And so I realize these pictures I've had in my head of God sharing His glory with Moses, they're not right. And, and, and as I've dug in the passage some more, what, what is profound to me is what God reveals to Moses is what? What happened when the Lord passed by Moses on top of that mountain? Exodus 34 6 through 8, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, 
keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and the fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Moses' response as the Lord passed by was to get on his face and to worship. And what was it that was revealed to Moses? It wasn't a shiny person, big person, giant walking by. God told Moses what he was like. God told Moses what he was like. And as Moses was hearing this, and how precious was it for Moses to hear this revelation of God that he was patient and that he was willing to forgive? How important was that for Moses to hear at this moment? You see, we take so much for granted. We're New Testament Christians, right? We have the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ. But if you go back and you put yourself in these times and these places of these people and what they're hearing, what God is showing them, right? How precious it was to them at that moment to learn that thing about God. And as God revealed himself, as there was revelation, and I hope that as you saw the title of the message, you weren't thinking we're jumping to the book of Revelations tonight. Maybe we'll do a passage there. But the idea is it's God revealing himself, God speaking, teaching, showing us something of himself. That's what made Moses worship. That's what made Moses worship. I made this comment there at McFerrin, and I'll make it again. The way we worship here, I used a phrase, smells and bells. You know what I'm talking about if I said smells and bells? I'm talking about this high liturgical worship where you have the incense and people with all the different sounds, and you have the big cathedrals and the stained glass and people thinking you have to go in some place like that to get this sense of awe and reverence with the, you know, the a cappella voices, oh, you know, in the background. I mean, that's how we get into a sense of worship. My friends, that is not the worship commanded in Scripture. Because the kind of worship that is commanded in Scripture is a worship based upon the revelation of God to us. God revealing Himself to us. God telling us something about himself, and by God's Spirit, we're able to perceive that, understand that, hear that, learn that, and that promotes in us not just stacking a bunch of facts up in our head, but it puts us in a position of awe. This is precisely what Sister Angie was talking about is as that as we consider the cross in Psalm 22, as we consider what Jesus did. We're not just trying to learn a bunch of Sunday school facts, are we? Because what does that do in the heart of God's children? What should it do? It should cause us to want to worship Him. You see, that truth, that revelation of God is meant to move us. And true worship doesn't have to be in a glorious cathedral. It can be in a cave. It can be in a house. It can be in a field. It can be when you're driving your car. Any place where God's truth, truths about God come to you and impact you in a powerful way where you see and realize and appreciate who our God is more. And from that, lift up a voice of praise and thanksgiving. That's worship. That's real worship. What else? Let's look at some more places. Let's go to Galilee. Let's go to a night when there was a great storm on the sea and the disciples were afraid and Jesus wasn't with them. Then they see this, what they think is a ghost walking by and turns out it's Jesus and he walks over to them on the water. Walking on water in the midst of a storm, Peter comes out at Jesus' consent and starts to walk, saying Jesus lifts him back up and says, oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? And what the Bible tells us there in Matthew chapter 14, when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, 
Truly, you are the Son of God. What, what prompted the worship? It says they worshiped. What was it? There was something in front of them that they saw that demonstrated in a real, tangible way the power of Jesus Christ. That they seeing him walk on water, calm the storm, lift Peter up, enable Peter to walk on the water, first of all, even if it was just for a few steps. Who cares if it was two or three steps? Peter walked on water. Amen. I mean, seriously. And seeing that happen... And then Jesus lift them up and all those things get back in the boat. They're on their faces worshiping him. Because what? Because Jesus had revealed something of himself to them in that experience. Something of himself. There was truth that was conveyed. And they didn't walk away like, huh, I didn't know Jesus could walk on water. Hmm. No. I mean, they were amazed. They were blown away. It caused them to reverence him and lift him up. Go with me now to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Let's go to Gennesaret. And we're going to actually read a, a bit longer passage here. Matthew chapter 15. I'm going to try to be disciplined and keep moving through this. Matthew chapter 15. Different situation completely. Jesus was in Gennesaret, and it says, There came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which are of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. So they came to Jesus because as a leader, as a, a considered a rabbi among the people, he was not upholding the traditions. The elders had passed down. You have to wash your hands. Now, this is not something that was in the Bible. But it was simply their tradition. It was a strong tradition. A long-standing tradition. But a tradition. And he answered them and he said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? He calls out a different tradition here. He doesn't talk about the hand washing. He calls out a different tradition they had. Um, a, a tradition called Korban, whereby you could take your assets while you were alive and say, when I die, my money is going to go to the temple. So because I've said my money is going to go to the temple when I die, I don't have to use it to help anybody else while I live. Because if I give you the money, then, then I can't give it to God later. Mom and dad, sorry, you're sick and you're dying and you need help. Can't give you my money. Because I'm going to give it to God when I die. Jesus points out, verse 4, For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother. He that curses father and mother, let him die the death. But you say, Whoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift. That's that rule of Korban. By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. That's what they were saying. He says, thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. You've, you've basically taken your new rules and you've overrided the word of God, the revelation of God. He said, you hypocrites... And look at, the, look at the conclusion Jesus makes in verses 7, 8, and 9. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draws nigh to me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Here's the crux of the matter. Jesus said, when you exalt your tradition over and above the word of God to the place where God's word is displaced by your tradition, your worship is empty and it's meaningless. You can talk the talk all you want, but if a thing that you are exalting is your own tradition and it's not the word of God, you see, true worship is based upon the revelation of God. It must be in truth. No matter how sincere you want to say your, your worship is, if it's not based on truth, it's not based in a way that is pleasing to God. It is not worship that he sees or accepts. And so Jesus lays it out here very 
clearly as he deals with the scribes and Pharisees, if it's not based upon what God has revealed of himself to us, it's not real worship. Let's look at another one. Let's go to Corinth now. And Paul is talking to the Corinthians. And the Corinthians had this issue. They liked the flashy gifts. They liked, by gifts I mean spiritual gifts, like speaking in other languages. They liked to use, they had that gift at that time, and they were using that gift in services, worship, to speak in other languages. The problem is, when they got up and spoke in French or Spanish or German or Swahili, nobody else who didn't speak those languages, they didn't know what they were saying. And they're like, well, I, I'm speaking thus by the Spirit because the Spirit has empowered me to speak this, so I'm speaking thus by the Spirit, but the problem is nobody knew what they were saying. And the Apostle Paul was, was getting on this church about this practice, and he's saying, look, when you all get together and you worship, people need to be able to understand what you say. And if there's not an interpreter to tell everybody in their native tongue what you've just said, then you should say it. Because the important thing is for the body to be able to get together and worship. Right? Real worship. You can say, well, I'm, I'm sincere and I'm, I'm speaking by the Spirit in this other tongue. And Paul says, is saying, sincerity alone is not good enough because you need what to be conveyed. Truth. You need truth to be able to be communicated for the worship, for it to prompt real worship in somebody else. There has to be some way of, of communicating what God is saying. And so Paul expands this on and he talks about prayer and he talks about singing. Two things that we understand and recognize as being real worship, right? And what does Paul say? What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. Sincerity, real of the heart. And I will pray with understanding also. I will pray knowing what I'm saying. Actually talking to God. Communicating with God. My prayer won't just be emotion. My prayer will be communication with God in some way. Same way with singing. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with my understanding also. The words that I sing have to mean something. He views singing in prayer as things that need spirit and truth, doesn't he? That's exactly what he's applying right there. Spirit and truth. Not one or the other. Not one better than the other. But you need both for it to be real worship. Another vignette. Jump now to Rome. Paul talks to the Romans. And y'all are familiar with this passage. Excellent passage. Amazing. Importance and significance in life. But look how Paul connects worship and our minds. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Right there, that means this is your spiritual service of worship. That's what he's saying, that you would present your life to the Lord. That is the way you worship God. And he goes on, and this is a parallel thing. These things are joined together. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove or discern what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul is connecting two concepts. Number one, he's connecting a surrendered will. Like, Lord, I want to lay down my life to serve you. I want to do what you would have me to do today. Lord, I want to be yours and given to you. And remember, we got to keep getting back on that altar every day because we keep crawling off of it. But what is Paul connecting that willingness, that heart, a sincere heart of desiring to serve the Lord? That is worship, yes. But what does that need with it? Well, Lord, what would you have me to do? 
right? Lord, what would you have me to do? I have to know. I have, to, I have to know and discern what God's will is. I need to have truth communicated to me by God so that I can worship Him by surrendering my life and know what it is He would have me to do. It's not just enough to say, Lord, I want to be surrendered to you. The next thing is, Lord, what would you have me do? We need spirit. We need truth. We need both of these things held together at the same time. We'll finally finish here in Revelation looking at these vignettes. The last one is in Revelation 15. Seven angels with the seven last plagues in heaven. And it says they sing the song of Moses in Revelation 15 verses 3 and 4. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. And the song of the Lamb saying, great and marvelous. They're singing to God. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. He, they, are, they are talking about how glorious the Lord is in all of His ways. And they finish this passage saying, the nations will come and worship. Why? As you reveal what you have done and you show what you've been up to and what your hands are accomplishing throughout this world, all your ways, as you reveal that, it's going to cause people to worship. What do you think is going to happen one day when we get there to heaven? And the Lord, you know, we talk about we'll understand it better by and by as the Lord begins to reveal that He knew what He was doing the whole time. Times we questioned, times we wondered, times we, you know, doubted everything else. And the Lord reveals His great and glorious purposes. What do you think is going to happen to you? You're going to worship. When the Lord reveals His ways. And you realize his thoughts have been higher and holier and he was doing way more than you ever knew. Folks, you're going to worship. It's just going to be one more reason you worship because that truth is being revealed to you and what should happen in your hearts as God reveals. We just glorify him more and more and more as he shows us his ways. And so we've looked at several little vignettes, little pictures here in scripture and I want to just take away From this, seven points. Seven points for us to to put into practice as we think about what do we do with these truths as we consider these. And there could be way more than this, but this is just a few things. Number one, takeaway. Preaching the word in our services must be preeminent. As we gather together to worship, and this is not about elevating me, it's simply about elevating what God has set up to happen when we worship. And it is about holding the place of the pulpit as we gather. I think I told you the story of of, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, a Welsh preacher, who when he came into a church and they had been very entertainment-based, he came and he nailed the pulpit down. You're no longer going to take this out because the centrality of when we gather together, it's not about the preacher. It's about sharing the truth of God's Word. God speaking to us. Because that is the basis of real worship. Now, I know sometimes we get together and and our tendency is to be, you know, to downplay that. And, And I've heard it as many times you know, like we had a good service today. There was no preaching. And, and I get that because there are days that you want those times of harvest. But a good service is not defined by a lack of preaching the word. It's like me saying, you know, I had a great dinner tonight. Mary didn't cook. <laughs> oh, now you get it, right? That's not true. And you guys, you all know better than to say something like that, don't you? Right? But this is not about me or about my feelings. It's about the centrality of God's word. And even when, think about this, even when we're in a service where we hear people popping up and telling us they've been saved or sharing testimonies, right? What's happening? What's happening? It's, if it's right and if it's good, 
It's, it's just like the disciples being in that boat and seeing Jesus walk on the water. We are seeing manifestations of God's power. God is communicating to us, around us, in tangible ways, ways that He is still working in our midst. And as we hear that, as we see that, it moves our hearts to glorify Him. And central in our service is always got to be communication of truth about God. Truth has got to be coming out. And not just to preach, but number two, we've got to rightly divide doctrine. That's got to be a priority for us. Because like Jesus told the Pharisees and the scribes, look, you guys are elevating tradition above the word, so what you're doing isn't real worship. We need to continue to emphasize right doctrine because when doctrine is done right, when doctrine is done right, it moves our hearts to worship God. When it's done right, it should move us to glorify and honor and appreciate Him more. Something else, our songs, our music needs to convey truth about God to be real worship. As we think about what we sing, if we think about adding new songs or going back and looking at more old songs, this is the standard. And I, I, have, I have died on this, uh, on this cross a few times as I've, you know, over the years turn people down, they hear this great song, like, oh, I just really love this new song. Oh, it's just, it's just so powerful. And you start looking at the words and saying, what is this telling us about God? What's it saying about Him? What's it saying about us? Are these things really true? And Oh, well, it's got a good melody. I mean, I, I, like, I, like, the, I like the chorus. Like, well, yeah, but you, know, you typically don't just get up and sing the chorus. You sing the whole song, and it's not all true. Amen. And it doesn't matter if it feels good and everybody likes it. We need to train ourselves. If our songs elevate tradition over truth, if they promote false views about God, if they inflame sinful passions, it's not real worship, even if everybody likes it. Okay? We've got to think about what we sing because singing is a, is a profound way of worshiping God. Number four, we can't check out during church. We've got to engage our minds. We've got to discipline ourselves. And I know it's way easier for me than for the rest of you because i got to get up here and talk, but you all got to sit there and listen most of the time. Okay? But it's something that we all have to engage ourselves in during the singing, you know, and during the prayers that, that we're there, Amen. that we're present to the extent, I mean, and we're all human, right? But, but to, be, to the extent we can be that we're present because true worship is not something you just kind of coast through. It requires you to hear and to receive and to think. And then as that's coming in, God's Spirit working in your heart, so what comes out of you is praise and glory to God. Sometimes people want to go to church and just kind of sit there and just kind of hope something big happens, and then they'll pay attention and get engaged. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. Amen. We need to be engaged and active in this and not just drift through service or come in hoping, coming in hoping something big's going to happen. Number five, when testimonies are shared, testimonies can be profound ways of, of transmitting truth about God that can cause people to worship. But here's a key. The, the key of a good testimony is that God is always the hero. Amen. The key of a good testimony is that it's about lifting him up and not about lifting me up. I can be the butt of the joke. That's okay. You know, I can be the foil. But he's always got to be the hero if it's going to be a God-glorifying testimony because it's about magnifying him and sharing with other people what God has been doing in my life or around me, something I've seen. That's what produces real worship. Number six, we need truth to be clearly communicated. And it's not just from the pulpit, but it's when you stand and testify, when we pray, when we sing, we need to do it in a way that can be heard and understood, because if it's worth being said, it's worth being heard. Amen. Isn't it? Right? 
And, and to the Corinthians, Paul said, look, for if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? They used trumpets back then, you know, over these large distances where you had a large army to gather together. They would use a loud trumpet so people would know what to do and they could all do it together. So they had signals. One blast means this. Two blasts means this. You know, a long one means this. But if the person playing the trumpet kind of, everyone's like, what was that? They don't all know what to do. And, and Paul was using that in the context of, of Christians gathering. We need to make sure that we try to communicate the truth because that's the basis of how we can all really come together and worship. And finally, and this goes along so well with what Sister Angie sang tonight, Jesus Christ must be the main attraction. Brother Binion uh, nailed this into my head. Um, he's said this at Victory for years, and I, I think it's just, the, it's just the best thing for us to think that when we come together, gather together, we all take part in different ways. We have our piece in the puzzle, but the one who we all need to be here for, who needs to be on center stage every time we gather, is Jesus Christ. Because it's in Jesus Christ that God has declared his glory, the glory of God, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He is the one through whom we may truly worship our God in spirit and in truth because in Christ, in Jesus, God has uniquely manifested all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge he has poured into his son and set him before us that we might behold all that we might know here on this earth about God. It's displayed most perfectly in Jesus Christ. And so we must come together and behold Him if we would behold our God. Thank you all for your attention tonight. Is there anything on anyone's heart this evening before we go into our business meeting here in just a few moments? Bless you, brother. Let's all stand. We'll sing a verse of amazing grace. I would open the doors of the church, but as I scan the room, to my knowledge, everybody here is already a member of the church. So let's just stand and sing a verse of amazing grace. And if I'm wrong, and somebody's here and needs to unite with the church that isn't already a member, you all have heard uh, how we do that. Testimony, experience of baptism, letter from a church of like faith and order. Rule three.